I am very pleased and excited uh, this afternoon to be able to hear from Doug Glanville. He's going to present for us today, still not cool, but happy. So bring it on, Doug. Well, I'm glad you didn't turn the station on that there. <laughs> NPR has been a great friend there. Um, well, you know, it's, it's been fantastic, and I, I feel like I'm the cleanup hitter here towards the end. Of the, and uh, so the advantage is I get to see everybody's work and these ideas, and it's, it's, uh, it's really amazing. And uh, certainly the theme is shift, and I thought long and hard about, well, where do I fit into this concept of shifting? And I kind of came up with this idea that it's, maybe it's about shifting perceptions. Uh, many times in the locker room, uh, I'd be asked a question like, well, you know, uh, how do you talk to your teammates? You know, you're a smart guy, you're the smart guy in the room. Do you have anything to discuss with these guys? It, it was sort of this separation. And uh, I realized that I had this history that I wasn't paying attention to while I was playing, that I was the first, actually the first African-American Ivy Leaguer to uh, be a Major League Baseball player. So it started this sort of trend. I didn't really think about it until Will Venable, who came up with the San Diego Padres, uh, became uh, the second, and then they asked me about it. I said, "Wow, I didn't even realize this contest." So, so I don't, you know, but you know, so this is a, it was a new trail, and I realized that once I got involved with professional sport, that I, I wasn't this typical story, and there was a lot of negative associations. Like, you know, you get drafted, and, and there's a perception you're coming from the inner city, and we're saving you from something, and that wasn't my story. My story was my father came from Trinidad and Tobago, he immigrated uh, to the United States at 31 years old after being a teacher, and he started over in med school, you know, went all the way through med school, became a psychiatrist, my mom taught through my school system, so I had this tremendous support and academic uh, foundation. So that's where it sort of began. So I, I kind of came up with the idea of still not cool, but happy. <laughs> the idea being, you know, I went through the periods of, of being the engineer, science guy in school, and you started in the Ivy League, and there was this perception that once I got to the professional ranks that, oh, you're an Ivy Leaguer, so therefore there's certain things we could assume about you that maybe you're not tough enough or maybe you're not this. So I had to sort of navigate this and also being this sort of anomaly of being uh, a mystery to the history of what happened in baseball in terms of who was drafted, the type of backgrounds that these players had. So. I wanted to generally talk about it sort of being okay, this is my mission statement, so to speak, being okay with going from not being the cool kid in high school to not being cool in the coolest profession in the world, uh, and why it all boils down to staying true to yourself and your history. Um, so I kind of go into this definition, I thought it would be important that the academic side of me said, let me look up cool anyway, because it's, it's really complicated. And of course I go to Webster's and there's like 35 definitions, so I say, no wonder it's so complicated, you can't hit this moving target. But the one I liked was socially adept. Uh, and adept being either as a noun or adept as a thoroughly proficient. And so how, do you, how are you thoroughly proficient socially? It's pretty tough for an adolescent certainly to understand this idea. And certainly it, as you go into these unique fields, it, it doesn't really get necessarily any easier. So I, I broke it down into three different periods and I call them cool seeking periods. Right? So there's the, 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 the pre-professional, you look at my sort of, in my case, the college days in Ivy League uh, and high school, and then the professional, which is where I looked at this sort of relationship between inward acceptance and outward. And inward is sort of figuring out, okay, well, this is who I am, I'm okay with this, I can, I can work with this. And then outward is sort of, once you get into that culture, <clears throat> do you feel like that they're embracing you? Do you feel like you're, you have a, a, a niche, a space? And of course, after that, there was a reflective professional, which is sort of in baseball, very relevant because at 35 years old, basically I was retired. So you have to reflect very quickly in baseball in these type of sports, in these professions. And of course the post-professional post period, which is now where I stand in front of you. <clears throat> so um, actually more specifically, I mentioned in high school, I was a student athlete. Now nothing gets you less cool points than your mom being a teacher in your school. So, <laughs> so, that, so my mom taught math in junior high and in high school. So of course, I was the first ninth grade class, the first freshman class in my high school. So the, the ninth graders graduated to high school and the eighth graders, which I was in, graduated. So I never became king of the mountain in junior high. Of course, my mom graduated with me. She's like, I'm following you to high school. I was like, oh no, four more years. 
So s six years, six years, I, my mom was in my school. And then, of course, to add to the non-cool factor, I decided to take advanced placement physics and advanced placement chemistry in the same semester. And worse yet is that we were under, they, they didn't have enough students for physics. So I ended up helping to get a petition together to get the class. They were like, well, it's not enough students, so we're not going to have it. So we got a petition together to bring in advanced placement physics. So that did not help the cool points there. And, um, but it also did tie to race and cultural questions, black and white, fitting in. Uh, I was in a community, Teaneck, New Jersey, which was one of the first uh, communities to voluntarily integrate its elementary school. So it was a cutting edge community, very diverse. It's what I celebrated. So my worldview was shaped with this idea of diplomacy and working across historically divisive lines. And, and so I saw this example. So everywhere I went after I graduated, I didn't see this sort of cooperation. I, I got you know, strange advice from people. For example, when I was at college, um, one of the students that said to me, she's like, look, you know, I haven't really seen you at any of the black parties. Where are you? You know, you can't ride the fence. You either have to be on this side of the fence or that side of the fence. And, and that was sort of advice. I fortunately felt confident enough in my history and where I, where I stood that I was not going to listen to. But it was out there to see that there was a lot of pressure for you to choose, to be something, to be in that box. And, you know, and my experience told me that didn't make any sense, but that was not necessarily what a lot of people would experience. So now, once I got into college, at least I was sort of in the academic circles, people could relate to someone petitioning for advanced placement physics. I was in the same group. Uh, but then it became a bigger battle to fit into the club of baseball. Now, you know, who is this guy? And, and he's, he's sort of highly touted. I had a chance to get drafted out of high school. And I told the scouts, I said, don't bother. I'm going to college. Don't waste your draft pick. And they were sort of like, what? You know, we're giving you this opportunity. I'm like, look, I'm going to college. And, and it was just the, they just didn't know how to take it. And, and so the, the real story starts to unfold is on draft day. On draft day is, you know, the, the Chicago Cubs ended up choosing me first round pick. And so I was the 12th pick in the country. And most of the criticism I received on why I would be chosen or not be chosen revolved around my commitment to the game. And there was a perception that, well, you know, you're a major league player. You're going to be on your way. You know, how can you, how can you miss school? At one point, I missed a, a, a game in college to study for a final, for example. And so the, all these became negatives. The fact that I was uh, focused on school, the fact that I chose Penn over going to a more baseball-oriented college uh, was, became negatives in my association. And I kept saying to myself, well, wait a minute, I'm not on scholarship. You know, I'm actually taking, you know, my own classes. I'm going through school. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working hard. We, when, when it ever it rained on the field, I had to pull the tarp on the field. Uh, the founder here, Al Myers, knows what I'm talking about. I had to pull the tarp on the field ourselves. There was 20 people in the stands. Uh, you know, we played because we loved to play. That's why we played. And I thought that would be a bonus uh, because it was a choice. And so it worked actually against me. So I ended up dealing with a lot of issues from that standpoint. But once I got drafted, I did develop a little different kind of confidence. The dating game kind of opened up a little bit for me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was, I was kind of now cool for a geek. You know, I kind of stepped it up. Um, but there was labels out there. There was labels that were um, very difficult to sort of shake. And I wasn't familiar with this process of like all of a sudden being this sort of public figure and people having uh, opinions about me that I'd never met in my life and never known. They're writing reports and reviews. My first scouting report said that Glanville spends more time philosophizing than he does practicing. <laughs> I was like, this is interesting. You know, <laughs> first of all, I didn't know philosophizing was a word at the time, but you know, <laughs> philosophizing and practicing. So that was my heat. So you know, I became this first round pick, and you know, those are the criticisms there. Too academic. I wasn't dedicated. Uh, I remember one of the scouts said to me, he said, well, you know, Glanville doesn't just ask you what time it is. He asked you how you built the clock. That's what they, so they just were not, they were not comfortable with me engaging conversation. Like, okay, this is how you lay down a bunt. That's fine. But, you know, do you angle it this way? You know, I wanted to understand it and just so I could replicate it. And it became, um, you know, challenging authority. It, it was a negative. It was taken as a negative instead of someone trying to expand the possibility. So you know, I had to learn how to navigate sort of the sentiments, the feelings that I was of the people I was engaging with and learning from, which was you know difficult, especially when my mind just inquisitively wanted to understand more. So we moved on, and and so you know after 
this I finally get drafted and I go into the minor leagues. And this is a whole other world here. It, it, it's, it's where you come from all over the world and players descend on this one place. And now you have a whole new social network. How do you get along with this guy? And my first roommate was a sleepwalker and they just assigned me to him. So I was like, okay, you know, one night he's, he's laying in between the beds and uh, he's talking to himself and I'm talking to him, he's not responding. And then he gets up from his, his, his stupor and he just crawls in my bed. I said, well, wait a minute here. This is not, this is, this is not what's going on. And so, you know, this is what happens. And so I'm like, okay, this, and of course I was the first round draft pick so they knew I was the bonus baby. I signed for a decent amount of money and so everybody wanted to borrow money off me. Oh yeah, hey man, you know, I need $25 for a new set of spikes. And so I became this interesting target but they were really worried about this too smart for your own good. As I, I called it too school for cool kind of thing, the other way. And so, you know, am I tough enough? You know, I could always leave. We had a pitcher, Scott Weiss, he just walked. They, they didn't send him, he wanted to go to the next level, the double A, from A ball, double A, triple A, and they didn't send him a double A. He said, look, I got a Stanford economics degree, see you later. So they were like, is Glanville gonna do that after we invested this money in this guy? Fair question, but they assumed that because of my academics that I was not strong enough to stay through it. Will I walk at the first sign of adversity? Will I overthink every situation and challenge authority? So it was a challenge to really deal with all these. And so eventually the sort of great equalizer was eventually I get the call up. And I was not without difficulty. I had a manager in AAA that despised me and did everything in his power to sort of keep me from making it to the next level. But that was part of the thing that I realized at that moment you have to thank your sort of adversaries or your detractors as much as you have to thank the people that supported you because sometimes they help you understand where you stand and they make you fight and so I learned to appreciate that. But Big Leagues was, it was great. I, I think of Bull Durham. Bull Durham, there's a scene with Crash Davis, Kevin Costa talking to Tim Robbins who's the Ebby Calvin Lelouch prospect coming up and he goes to him and he's like, hey man, you got, you got fungus on your shower shoes. You got fungus on your shower shoes. He's like, now if you're in the big leagues, they will call you colorful and unique. But in the minor leagues, you're slob. That's all you are. So, so you realize like the big leagues change everything. So wait a minute, he's an Ivy Leaguer. This is cool. My kids would want to you know, see this person that actually did both. And so it became a, a sort of a turn a little bit. And, and so I got parental support. It became more marketable. And then the dating change, you know, supermodel or bust, I talk about that. <laughs> but um, you know, it, it, was, it was just a different world. But then I wondered, I said, well, a lot of these guys, the social pressures of keeping up with the Joneses, now you get the money, now wait a minute, I gotta have this car, I gotta do this, I have to date this kind of person. And so you still have to know who you are, otherwise you can get lost in it. So the question is, can you buy cool? Maybe you can, but do you actually grow from it? So, so in the process, I get to this reflective and post-professional career. Getting a little older, I'm 32, the hamstrings are bothering me, they're starting to run you out of town a little bit. And so I get closer to the end and then I ask that question, does cool really matter? Is that really what it's about? You know, I've always, I've come from this path where I was unique and, and battling and carving my own space and maybe that's the, that's the course. And then I looked and I think about all the, infer the, the things that we've shared today and I said, wait a minute, to shift perception, that is, that is the actual seedling of change. That's how you change. That's, you know, Alexander Graham Bell, just imagine when he tried to come up with the idea of a phone, and you know, I remember a stand-up comedian talking about this. It's like, can you, you know, he's telling someone, oh, I want to talk to the person way over there. And they're probably like, this guy's out of his mind, right? You know, I mean, everybody who's done something innovative and different and challenged authority and, and really took risk because they probably were gonna not be cool. And so, you know, so self-confidence came with it. And, and I started thinking, what actually happened to the cool kids in high school? You ever wonder that? It's like, wait a minute, you know, did, how, how did it turn out for them? You know, and, and so maybe that's not the path. Maybe they're not the leaders. Maybe it's something that being unique is part of leadership and being strong within that. So post-career came along and I started to see these options and they became a gold mine. They weren't negative. It wasn't that I was distracted or not focused or didn't care about something. You know, you see these reports of this Rhodes Scholar in the NFL and they, they, it's a negative that this guy wants to actually study something. I mean, the game is, is celebrating so much that you have to be one-dimensional because they think that's commitment and that's it's a disservice. You know? so, so, so when the music stops, like who's gonna wanna dance with you? And I, I, that's the question. So, so I kinda came up, this is something I wrote at one point, but I talked about describing the major leagues. And it said, peer pressure drives the social circle in major league baseball. Much of, it, of your time is spent conquering and burying that old self, that high school kid with braces or acne so that he can now fit in, be accepted be desired, but too bad all you end up doing is bringing him back to life, 
desperate to be cool years after you could have just outgrown them. You know, so a lot of times, you know, we spend time you know, going in these circles. And I thought that you know, what I pulled from it is there is a full circle to this. You, know, you, you can go through it. And a lot of my career was label shaking. You know, a lot of people can relate to that. You're shaking labels. You're this, you're that. You know, in baseball, you're the slow bat. You got a good glove. You got the two cent head. Uh, you know, you're the party animal. You're the millionaire's club. Mr. Nice Guy. All these things kind of come with it. And you spend time and maybe another label, label sticks. I'm at ESPN now. Now I have to assess, like, am I too quiet for the set? Am I too loud? Am I this guy? So you're always dealing with these labels. And it takes a lot to, to, bra to brave those things and to step beyond them and say, wait a minute. You can throw everything, and it's just not going to stick. It's certainly not going to stick in how I see myself or how I see possibility. And, and a lot of people try to put you in that box, and, and it's, you have the power to, to not accept that. So I see it as a circle sort of infinite beginning points and end points. And, and sometimes you come back to, the, in, to that self and you, you reflect. And, and certainly I had the, the advantage of having a career in a very short period of time. 15 years, is a, it was a baseball career for me. And I got to see the beginning and the end and all the little phases and iterations and changes that happen along the way. And so I realized that this loop of time is rolling along. It's sort of like planetary motion, in, in some cases social, uh, socially so where you're revolving and you're rotating. You're moving forward, you're aging, and you're experiencing things. And all that connects so well that it's such a dynamic process that when you're not changing, you, can, you could actually find yourself stagnating and, and not adjusting. So I see it as the sun and, and the way it's survival was keeping that constant. The sun and, and, and is an analogy. It provided orientation and goals, my ability to adapt. I had this focal point and certainty, and I was proud of you know, where I came from, and, and that was a huge part of it. So the key factors I look at is family, friends, faith, certain stabling, stabilizing forces that says this is a target, this is a goal, this is something that's core to you, that so that when labels are thrown at you and all these different things, it, it doesn't shake your foundation. You know, so I look around and I recognize that everybody here probably wasn't in the, the cool school, right? I mean, let's, <laughs> you probably weren't the cool crowd, people probably weren't following you, but I realized you know, something very profound, and today just reinforces that fact, is that that's OK. You can not be cool, but you can be happy. And as a result, you can inspire, and you can change perception. And, and part of changing perception is how you really change the world. And, uh, and that's been my story, and I've been um, you know, very fortunate to share that. So now I, you know, I, I write about it, and I, I express it in every form I can to really bring together and humanize the experience of sport and, and try to see that everybody sees it in their, in their own lens. It is really everybody's story. And uh, so, you know, thank you for having me. It's been a, a pleasure. And, you know, be happy. Don't worry about being cool. <laughs>